Welcome to Online Off Script, where we discuss trending topics and all things new on the internet. I'm Sam Olmsted, New Orleans Managing Director. And I'm Eliza Philo, the Digital Ads Coordinator. This week, we're talking about the role of nonprofits in communities. Our guest today is Michael Williamson, the President and CEO of United Way of Southeast Louisiana, a nonprofit organization aimed at eradicating poverty in Southeast Louisiana. Michael has served as President since 2013 and was previously the COO for four years and the VP of Field Leadership for United Way of America, now United Way Worldwide, for five years. Thanks for joining us, Michael. How are you? I'm doing well. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. So can you just start off by telling us about yourself and your work at the United Way? Let's see. Let's try to do this as, as quick as possible. Um, I'm considered somewhat of a United Way lifer. I spent most of my working professional career um, at United Way in about 26 years, probably approached more closer to 27, 28 years now in the nonprofit sector. Um, but I'm originally from South Carolina, born and raised. I uh, spent some time at the United Way Worldwide offices in Alexandria, Virginia for about five years. And about 14 years ago, give or take, brought my family to Southeast Louisiana, where we nestled in on the North Shore and kids attended all the public schools and my wife's practic practicing her craft and uh, enjoying every minute of it. Nice. I, uh, I was just in South Carolina last weekend in Charleston. Uh, my first time ever there. I loved it. Um, a little warm, but uh, nothing we're not used to down here. So, and I grew up in Washington D.C., so close to Alexandria and uh, another great area. So, um, fun to see paths cross like that. Um, I'll just jump into the first question after that. So, uh, can you explain why nonprofits are so crucial in addressing local issues? Yeah, I mean, I think it's a, it's a great question. Um, and it should feel obvious to folks. If not, I'm just gonna state the obvious. Um, we know that government alone cannot address all the social challenges that, that we have in our communities. And we know through history that it's often been, you know, not just government acting alone, but the nonprofit sector and the faith sector working together um, in a more collaborative way to address some of the more intractable social challenges we, we face. Um, and so um, nonprofits are uh, desperately needed. Um, and we'll probably get into it, but they're also, while they're under-resourced, typically, they are extremely nimble and adaptive and can move much faster um, than other entities, that, um, for example, like government. You know, the wheels of government sometimes turn slow. And for all the right reasons, nonprofits, certainly like United Way and others, can move a lot faster. Um, you mentioned nimbleness, and I remember reading how the United Way, right when COVID hit, y'all managed, what was it, like in three weeks or something, to raise um, millions of dollars, um, which I think that just speaks to that nimbleness. But you also mentioned challenges. Uh, I think resources are kind of a more obvious one, but can you talk to us kind of about the challenges that you face as um, the head of a nonprofit? And I guess to piggyback off of that, how you create lasting change and not just, you know, like a Band-Aid solution. Wow, I love I love that, that question. <laughs> uh, well, let me start with kind of the pride point, which is our response to COVID, where in a matter of, you know, well, just a two, three short weeks, we launched our Hospitality Cares Pandemic Response Fund in partnership with the Louisiana Hospitality Foundation. And quite honestly, I felt if we could raise a million dollars to help struggling hospitality workers that lost their jobs, we, would, we could have called it a success. Um, we ended up raising $2.4 million and we gave 4,800 displaced hospitality workers a $500 check cash payment, if you will, to help meet any of the basic needs they were facing because they were out of work. Um, but we did that so fast. Um, and so to your point, to our nimbleness and just um, in the partnerships that came along, the, the businesses and organizations and individuals that all rallied because they understood the importance. But it, it started with 
seeing the local and national reports around the effects of COVID on the hospitality industry to like conversations internally. And next thing you know, we're launching a fund. And we're blessed to have our friends at the Louisiana Hospitality Foundation that can help us, us do that. Um, I think while we're nimble and speak to the challenges that we face as nonprofits, um, we're often under-resourced. Um, we're expected to do a lot with a little. We're expected to operate on very, very thin margins. Um, in some ways, we need, we're need we called on to act like a business as far as our level of professionalism and you know our ability to deliver results. Um, but then we're funded you know, like a, like a not-for-profit. Um, but, but we, we pride ourselves on doing a lot with a little, um, but I will make the appeal in the case for that a, that a well-resourced nonprofit that has a competent and capable staff team, um, cause we have some of the best professionals, I would dare say in the world that work for our organization, you're going to get more bang for your buck. You're going to get a better, um, return on investment something that you would say would be comparable to a for-profit organization or business of similar size. Um, but we have to kind of break that, you know, we have to overcome that myth and, and break that stereotype. So when you see us and experience us, you're going to feel like you're, you're working with, you know, a 15 to $20 million a year business. What are some ways to break that myth? I mean, what, how do you, how do you break the mold and how do you make it so that nonprofits can, work uh more streamlined and have that financial backing that they really need so i think everything to me everything's always a two-way street you know the one is we have to be able to deliver like we have to be able to deliver results at a quality and scale that warrants the investment that an individual would make in us but at the same time individuals i believe need to have open minds as far as like just even just our implicit bias around nonprofits, something that's developed, you know, throughout the history of nonprofits. Um, you know, individuals themselves have to work on kind of overcoming those biases and just looking at us for the results that we get, um, the way we approach our work, the nimbleness. You know, like, you know, as we were beginning some of our early transformative work, we were looking at not just nonprofits, but businesses. And we fully understood that, you know, in that case, we need to move at the speed of business. So what would a for-profit business be doing in scenarios that we were facing and try to model those types of behaviors because, um, you know, businesses are very shrewd about how they develop and deploy resources. Kind of on a separate note, um, but maybe related. How do you feel like as a nonprofit, you navigate partnering with the government and municipalities and um, companies? I mean, how, how does that work? I don't really know. So I'm, I'm just curious. It's a, I don't it's know a either. Great, <laughs> no, it's a great question. To, obviously, we're a lot of great questions. Um, so kind of start with this idea that collaboration isn't easy. And often it's messy. It's kind of like that analogy, you know, you like to eat sauces, but you don't want to see it made, right? Um, you know, working in the working across the public and private sector requires, um, I would say, a good, strong center of gravity, like really understanding who we are and what our strengths are. And finding organizations, either for profit businesses, you know, the private sector, or the public sector, government entities that has similar goals in mind and make sure that those goals are centered as well. So they're always the North star for what we're trying to achieve and then allow everybody to bring, you know, their authentic selves and their, their strengths, you know, to this collaborative table proverbial, if you will. Um, that's critical, but listen, there's a lot of trust building that has to take place. You have to overcome, turf and you don't want to insult by someone by suggesting let's do something different because they may have been doing something the same way for dozens of years so you have to work through that to build to build trust um and quite frankly with government because we do a lot of work with government entities we have to be willing to operate within the guidelines that that they have that have been put in place either by order or by law and so Lots of paperwork, 
you know, lots of reporting. It's expensive to administer projects that have government funding, either federal, state, or local, because there are very stringent reporting requirements. Not to say that's not important. Um, it is, and we pride ourselves on transparency and accountability, but it's, and oftentimes, like the funding you get can barely cover, like any you might think have for direct and direct costs, you know, can barely cover those costs. And Not what we do as an organization, and yeah, what we do as an organization, like we step in and say, is this mission aligned? And so we'll subsidize some of those costs because it's mission aligned and we're looking for the results that we can deliver as a part of this collaborative approach. That's a good point also. Like when you say mission aligned, what is the mission? And it seems so broad. So how do you pick the projects? How do you pick the people? And and um, and does that fall all on your shoulders or, or how does that work? So um, now we have worked diligently to grow our relevance in the region, very intentionally starting about 11 years ago, but certainly from an action oriented state, yeah, you know, 10 years ago when I became the chief executive officer, um, but doing the work of you know, building your relevance and seeing as an authority and a leader in the space, our broader issue is poverty. You know, our objective is to eradicate poverty throughout Southeast Louisiana. Um, but we also kind of pull that down in some very practical ways by focusing on, you know, stability, economic prosperity, vibrant communities and personal wellness. And so we, we operate in the spaces of education, health, and financial stability. And so when you kind of get below the surface of that, you can see the way we fund, who we fund, the work that we do, our public, our public policy and advocacy agenda, they're all aligned with that bigger you know, you know, mission. And then you know, that's towards helping us realize our vision where of equitable communities where all individuals are healthy and educated and economically stable. And so um, but it's deep, you know, it's, you can see it on the surface. You can say, that's cool. That seems very broad until you get into actually how we do it. Yeah. But, and, and I, and I totally see that. And when you said about funding, do you also act as a group that allocates funds to different organizations? So you raise oh, money sure. and then, and then you send that out. Interesting. Absolutely. We have, it's interesting. Um, we've been doing some research as far as the, I would call it transformation 2.0 um, for our organization, kind of the next leg of our journey. And we came across um, this graphic that speaks to these levels that organizations operate at to affect change from internal programming all the way through public policy and advocacy. And there are layers, almost concentric circles. Um, based on our study of ourselves, we found that we operate at all of those levels. And we actually do it exceedingly well, but United Way historically, kind of our beginning in Southeast Louisiana, almost a hundred years ago, we'll turn a hundred next year. It was around this idea of raising money and funding local nonprofits to deal with pressing issues. And we still do that. We still put out millions of dollars a year in grants to nonprofit organizations while also funding internal programs like you know, what I mentioned off camera with the Prosperity Center in Bogalusa, funding public policy and advocacy, developing collaborations where gaps in programs exist or where systems need to be retooled. And so we operate at all levels, but we still fund you know, millions of dollars to local nonprofits. Can you tell us about this Bogalusa project? Because a lot of times when I, when I see you on LinkedIn, you're wearing a suit. So this is a little <laughs> di different. <laughs> Yeah, you know, I put on I put on the body armor, you know, when I when I go to meetings where I think it's going to be appropriate. I prefer the Live United shirt and the hat and tennis shoes and shorts on. Um, but we're actually um, uh, a critical part of how we're going to work to tackle the issue of poverty and family financial instability is through what we call a prosperity center model, and it's a one stop shop for financial capability building services. Everything from free tax prep to financial education to financial coaching, credit repair, all the way through to asset development and asset building, actually helping individuals build the skills and save money so they can purchase that first asset, house, car, you know, start a small business, go back to school. We've even added repairs to homes to the list, given where we live you know, um, in the country. So um, 
We have our flagship center, the Jane Wayne Leonard Prosperity Center, which is on Canal Street in New Orleans, 2401. Canal Street, we opened at North Columbia Street in Covington, uh, Louisiana, on the North Shore. And now we're way up here in Bogalusa on August the 17th. We're going to open the Bogalusa campus of our United Way Prosperity Center. So we're, uh, I'm in one of the offices right now. We did a neighborhood walk to hang bags on people's mailboxes with information about how they can access our, our services. And we're excited. I have to give a shout out to International Paper for their financial support, but also the new mayor in Bogalusa, Tyron Trone, 23 year old mayor um, who called upon us to bring more services uh, to Bogalusa. So we're up here walking the streets this morning. Great. Um, you mentioned 100 years coming next year. Do you all have any things happening around that that you can share? You look or... great, by the way, for 100. It's, uh... <laughs> I'm glad you said that because it's usually my joke. Um, <laughs> but uh, we, we do. We have, we put together an internal team this building on our plans for the next year. But our objective is to make everything we do throughout the year, every event, every experience tie back to our, our 100th anniversary. And we're looking at various ways to um, elevate that through various partnerships with entities that um, that have been aligned and been supportive. And so there'll be more to come on it, but we plan to have a year long focus on, you know, turning 100. One of the fun things about that is we have an archive committee that is going through and trying to source all kind of pictures and materials dating back as far as we can to our formation. And I was in a meeting yesterday with the hospital CEO, whose grandfather, I believe it was, was the former CEO of a New Orleans company, very active in United Way. And he just remembers as a kid, seeing pictures of his grandfather at a podium at the United Way signage in front of him. So we're trying to pull all that together and, and create this massive year long celebration. It's a great time for, for press and for leveraging that press that you know you're going to get in some capacity. We just had a client who uh, celebrated their 50th year. And so we, you know, we did a new logo and put out a press release and did, you know, all the things that you want to do to draw eyeballs because eyeballs are our money too. You know, it's fundraising, it's donors. Exactly. Exactly. You got the swag <laughs> there. Uh, I like that logo too. Um, so that's pretty exciting. Um, I remember the uh, the New Orleans tricentennial too, which was a few years ago, and kind of all the work around that, and they had the different activations across the, you know, different parts of the city. So, um, did did you get inspired by that at all, or or where are you pulling this uh, this inspiration from? We did, and there are United Ways across the country. You know, we're a network of United Ways across the country and across the globe. So you see others that may have achieved that milestone before us, and we look at what they're doing. Ironically, with the tricentennial, um, you know, we had some, we were able to contribute some historical, you know, information during that time. And then after the, the, the Katrina at 10, like the, the 10 year anniversary and the day of service that took place across the region, our volunteer center had an active role to play on that. So we've been a part of lots of celebrations. And to your point, like we want to, for us, it's a celebration. We want the marketing exposure, you know, the the brand exposure, if you will. We just want to celebrate what it feels like to make 100 years as an organization that has stayed true to our core while evolving to meet the ever changing needs of the community. So it's a uh, so it's you know it's a it's gonna be a fun time for us to be able to to do that. We want to be very genuine and authentic, you know, yes, we will raise money around it. We got ideas around how we can do that, but all around this experience of United Way, you know, a hundred years later. I realize I probably should have asked this at the top of the podcast, but this is very much on topic. Can you tell us just a little bit about the history of United Way, Southeast Louisiana, kind of where it started very quick mm -hmm. until yeah. where we are now? Yeah. So, um, Started as most United Ways did as a community chest, um, you know, here in New Orleans. Um, evolved over time to uh, to the United Fund. Think about the history of United Way community chest. 
to United Fund um, in, I think it was the mid 70s, give or take. The United Way brand was developed. Actually, the name and the branding was developed and been United Way ever since. And in New Orleans, you know, we took up that mantle 100 years ago and been a part of that that journey is that we've developed from the community chest um, to what we are today. Um, so true to our purpose and our cause, you know, addressing some of the tough challenges in our community, but squarely focused on poverty and poverty eradication through both program funding, collaborative level systems change, public policy and advocacy, the mobilization of volunteers, mm-hmm. and doing all that and trying to do it exceedingly well. Yeah, thanks for, thanks for the history. So, um, you know, as a business, we like to be um, living up to our values as well. We do quarterly volunteer events. Most recently, we worked with Culture Aid NOLA, which provides um, food, um, I think no barrier food uh, for tons of different families around New Orleans. Um, and I just wanted to ask, give you the opportunity to talk a little bit about other programs that um, you may work with or have in the New Orleans area, just because we're New Orleans headquartered, um, and what you're helping to do with food insecurity or homelessness or some of the, the issues that we kind of see on a regular basis. So kind of, once again, just reflecting on our history, our United Way helped develop what is now Unity for the Homeless. Um, you know, so that this, the, the homeless, the top of the pyramid as far as the Homeless Coalition in, in New Orleans, Unity, Greater New Orleans was, you know, started by the leadership of, of our United Way. Um, we continue to fund organizations that work on issues around you know, food security, our friends at Second Harvest, um, and food banks throughout the region we often partner with. Interestingly enough, with Culture Aid NOLA, some of our post-pandemic ongoing work, we did some um, we did some work between our volunteer center and Culture Aid NOLA, um, so know them you know, extremely well. And we continue to try and ways try to find ways to foster the volunteer spirit. And so we have our United Way um, hands-on volunteer center that's uh, supported by Shell. Um, so thank you, Shell, for that. And that's a place where people can go to connect with volunteer opportunities throughout the year. So I always encourage folks to go to unitedwayseela.org volunteer. You can sign up, you can get updates. And when volunteer opportunities appear, in other words, an organization puts an opportunity in, it matches up with individuals say, hey, I'm interested in that stuff. And then uh, and then they get notifications around those, those experiences. But we definitely encourage folks to, money's important. Like money is a fuel. But uh, what we see is when individuals are connected personally, like when they're getting their hands on the issue and they're volunteering with the organization, um, you see greater giving, but you see greater levels of satisfaction. And also volunteering is good for your health. It's good for workplace morale. Um, you've seen that if you've had people go out and volunteer. People feel good when they do that. And there's, I think there's even some scientific you know, reasons some science behind that as well. Usually a lot of early mornings and maybe some hot days or some cold days and you kind of drag yourself out there. And then by the end of the day, you're just so happy that you, you did it. So um, I definitely agree with that. <laughs> Yeah. Didn't mean to complain yeah, there. Well, um, yeah, I agree with that as well. Uh, and while we're on the topic, do y'all, have you found uh, specific strategies that work best for recruiting or uh, retaining volunteers? Or do you have just special strategies that you tend to use? Well, because of limited capacity, we tend to work with our top companies. So we offer our top 60 company supporters turnkey access to uh, volunteer engagement coordination services. And so it's an easy way to get to a lot of people through one point of entry. So if we go to pick a company and we go through a point of contact there, we offer up volunteer opportunities and you might have 10, 15, 20 or a hundred people you know, show up to be a part of that experience. And that seems to be effective. You know, the employers endorse it. They know it's important to their employees. They give people the latitude um, to do it or they try to reward them. Some, some will offer, you know, grants to the organizations they volunteer with. If they put so many hours in, so they incentivize it. But the, that seems to be 
the most effective and um, then people to people. I mean, as much as digital and social media are kind of like the thing today, standing in front of somebody and saying, hey, why don't you come out and help with this is still extremely effective. That's why we went door to door here in Bogalusa. Like getting people to come and interact with you, personally engaging is still extremely, extremely effective. Yeah, agreed. I think the last couple of volunteer events, besides the non-work related ones, I definitely was um, asked by friends to say, hey, I'm going to this thing Saturday morning. Do you want to tag along? I was like, sure, why not? Good for you. And that, and that's actually kind of leads into another question about inclusivity and, and getting more people into the tent of volunteering. Um, you know, a lot of times nonprofits work with marginalized groups and vulnerable populations. And what's the best way to make sure that your work is as inclusive as possible, your volunteers are, your corporate partners, um, and just making sure that you're kind of representing the folks within your areas? Yeah, no, that's, a, that's a great question, too. We have been very intentional over the past seven years around developing out our DEI muscle and our internal external external strategy work around that, both so that we're thinking about our employees, obviously first and foremost, to make sure that their experiences are positive because we have folks from all walks of, of lives, genders, race, et cetera. And so we focused on that, but that allows us to connect in the community uh, more genuinely and more authentically. And you have to think about like volunteer experiences. You mentioned that a lot of them are on Saturday. Well, you know, people are working during the week and they need to work to earn income. So you have to be able to do those things when they're able to break free because they want to get back to their community and being like culturally sensitive about like you know, their experiences. And we think about that, like where are we going to volunteer? What are we doing? How are we going to, how are we casting this so that folks you know, feel like everything's being done in a respectful way? You know, if we're going into a neighborhood to do a neighborhood cleanup, somebody's gone and kind of made the rounds with you know, the neighbors and make sure people know, like, and hopefully garner like trust and some engagement there. But I think starting with ourselves, both our staff and our board have been working to become you know, far more in tune with you know, who we are as an organization and the importance of diversity, equity, and inclusion for us, us as an institution. And that shows up in how we engage externally in the community. It shows up in organizations we fund. You know, we admitted 21 new organizations, um, 21 new BIPOC-led uh, organizations in our recent round of funding. So it's, uh, it's very much in... Uh, I say we're on a journey. We're nowhere near where I think we should be, but you know we've also decided we're going to be very authentic in our approach. You know, as an organization that's been around a long time, there are preconceived ideas about us. We want to work to change those, but do it the right way. And you mentioned that money is not the only thing that supports you all, but what can people do? What can we leave them with saying we should do this? Is it volunteering? Is it figuring out who y'all are funding and then supporting those? Nonprofits. Um, what does that look like? Sure. I, I think, of course, I would encourage everybody to try to do all three to the level you can do. You know, give, be a, be a donor to, to things you care about. Hopefully, you know, in a way you can help you with that. If not, you find the thing you care about and give to it. That's a positive thing. You know, then advocate, I think, um, and volunteer. But I'm going to go back to advocacy because we've talked about giving. We've talked about volunteering a good bit. But the single most effective way that we can create change at scale in our communities is through advocacy geared towards changing public policy, because we'll never fundraise our way out of the issues that are associated with poverty. But when we shape policy at local, state, and level, uh, national levels, then you see change at scale. You can literally move billions of resources, billions of dollars of resources in a way that can be aligned and far more effective with certainly our mission. So we encourage people to sign up for our advocacy alerts and pay attention to our legislative agenda. When we go to Baton Rouge, you know, join us there. And, you know, sometimes we ask, you know, we ask people to go up and testify, you know, tell about your lived experience and what this policy means to you. And if it was fixed, what that could do for you and your family and your community. And so 
I think, you know, public policy and advocacy, and we're unique as an organization, as Jenna Ways go, that our, we have a strong focus on public policy and advocacy, and we put an immense amount of resources against it because we understand that's what's going to tip the scale. Yeah, I'm so glad that you mentioned that because I also think that that kind of answers Eliza's first question about lasting change, um, because, you know, you can only you can only do so much on an individual basis. And um, if you're changing the laws and changing the way that our society operates, especially toward uh, vulnerable and marginalized people, then you're going to have that lasting change. Um, and uh, and it seems like, you know, Louisiana has had one of the poorer populations for a really long time. So. Um, what are, do you have any sort of big public policy pushes that you, if you could wave magic wand would do? Yeah. So, and I appreciate the focus on long lasting systemic change, because that is in fact, like what we, what we're here to do. Um, I'll start to answer the, the question at hand with the fact that we do, a study, it usually comes out about every 18 months called the Alice report. And the Alice report is a study of financial hardship and Alice is an acronym, which stands for asset limited income constrained employed. And it's really kind of the basis for how we approach our work around, you know, uh, stability and prosperity and vibrant communities and personal wellness. Cause what it tells us is individuals in Louisiana and Southeast Louisiana is the same. Um, don't earn enough money or make enough money, depending on which way you look at it, to meet their basic needs. Some live in poverty based on how our government defines it, you know, the federal poverty level, and others live slightly above but still can't afford the basics of housing and food and transportation. And often they fall through the cracks because they don't qualify for government assistance because they're not poor enough, but they're too poor to be able to afford the, their basic needs. And so that drives our policy work, trying just to create a greater understanding of what is a livable wage in, in Louisiana. You know, there's the debate around minimum wage and minimum wage changing it polls very well if you look at polling, but it's hard to get done. And we're using the Alice report to talk about what a livable wage looks like based on where you live. This is what you need to make to make ends meet. We think that's a tool not just for individuals, to advocate for themselves, but also for employers to understand the challenges facing their people, which COVID made that even more, more obvious. And so obviously the wage debate needs to be elevated. We need to find ways to wage street employers to employees, you know, find ways to grow wages, you know, also addressing issues around affordable housing. Um, you know, there's that teeter totter effect of, you know, as wages go up and demand goes up, you know, you know, so you get that. So you're trying to find that sweet spot around how do you create more affordable housing so the folks that are Alice, lower income households can afford to have a safe, sanitary place um, to live. We believe heavily in early care and education. Um, that early start, those formative years, even prenatal through, um, you know, uh, fourth grade are like essential years for long-term sustainable um, positive outcomes for for our young people and so we've worked hard to get more funding for early care and education so the last legislative session there's 52 million in it got taken out 44 million was put back in you know there's a lot of back and forth but we got dedicated funding for early care and education we saw that in new orleans with the city of new orleans dedicating three million dollars to early care and education which allowed them to tap into a state matching fund as well. So education, early education are important. And then other policies around things that are barriers to family financial instability, you know, access to capital, access to programs and resources that are going to help. We work a lot of banks around banking the unbanked, you know, because having a bank relationship is essential in this world, but a lot of people don't have a relationship with their bank. And so, um, but we have a full, agenda that we advocate for every year kind of lined up with the majority of that. Wow. I think we basically just scratched the surface on, on everything that you do, but we're going to wrap up here. And, uh, and before we do, Michael, is there anything that you want to promote or let people know about or where to find you as an organization? 
Absolutely. I think two things, the easiest thing to do is visit our website at unitedwayscla.org. Uh, I'd immediately go to the connect page because that way you can find different ways to connect. And of course, follow us on social at United Way or at UWSCLA is our handle and find us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. I'm on LinkedIn, Michael Williamson. I love followers. I post a lot of stuff out there as I bounce around. So either ways, but follow us, pay attention and reach out to us if we ever uh, be of service. Perfect. Well, Michael Williamson, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, and thanks for taking the time out of your schedule. You were a fantastic guest and we really appreciate it. Well, thank you very much for having me on. Thanks for joining us today. Be sure to subscribe and rate the podcast. And if there's anything you'd like to hear us discuss, reach out on Instagram, Facebook, or LinkedIn. And as always, stay optimistic.